Well, good morning. It is great to be with you today. It feels like the seasons are finally changing. Today feels a lot like fall. Just this week, we got the Amazon holiday catalog in the mail. And our kids are pumped. I mean, they all have their own custom pen color. They write their initials next to the toys that they're excited about that they hope to receive. They feel like Christmas is around the corner and that is exciting. But there are some toys in that catalog that I don't want them to see. There's some pages I wish I could just tear out. Not because they're bad or even because they're expensive, but because they're annoying. Do we really need another giant plastic fixture in our living room? Or how about those toys who, you know, someone thought it was a good idea. They have really obnoxious sounds, but no on and off switch. Or my personal favorite, the toys that require 200 pieces to work exactly as they intended they should be, or you can't use them at all. There are some toys that I hope my kids will grow out of. But then there's another toy that I hope they never grow out of. A toy that's always fun and innovative, and I don't know if it's the nostalgia from my childhood, from playing with it or what, but I love Legos. If our kids want Legos, we cannot wait to get them Legos because they're fun and something we can all do together and that span the ages. One of the best experiences we had with Legos is when we went to the Lego store in Disney Springs. And at this Lego store, there's you know, pretty impressive builds outside, like five or six foot Star Wars characters made out of Legos and Disney princesses made out of Legos. And then you go inside the store and there's certain sets that you can only find there or see in person. But a distinguishing factor of a Lego store in Disney Springs is that it's one of nine Lego stores that has a minifigure factory inside of it where you can go and design your own Lego minifigure. And so what you do is you go up to this computer kiosk and you can completely customize what your minifig looks like. You can paint the shirt and add text to it and you know, pick the colors and do all these sorts of things. Then you can mix and match all sorts of bottoms and accessories and make the Lego that you've always dreamed about this. Now our six-year-old son, he loved this experience and he took his customization to the max. I brought a picture, but I also have his minifig that he trusted me with right here. You can see, just, you know, just to give you an idea of the customization, on the front, he sort of painted the shirt, put a video game controller on it, and then wrote, everything is awesome, which is a quote from the Lego movie. But the back is where it really gets great, because he picked this rainbow tank top, and then put rainbow stars on it, and then put a $100 bill, and wrote the phrase, I love you. If that's not a custom minifig, I don't know what is. But he loves this guy and he made him in his image and he was so excited about it. Now at the Lego store, there are parameters to what you can create. There's a, a framework for what the minifig has to look like. You can't make it bigger than that. You can't make a Lego dog. You're there to make that one thing. But people get so excited about this customization that we had to wait almost two hours in a queue to have our turn. It's a big deal. But it makes sense, doesn't it? Because we live in an age of customization. Custom shoes, custom homes, custom cars, custom college majors. We want everything to fit our needs and our desires to be right as we think it should be. So why not a custom God? A lot of us approach thinking about God like going to a minifig factory where there's maybe a traditional framework of things that are gonna fit in him but then there's also tons of opportunity to customize as you see fit. You know, if you think about God and it feels like you don't really like the idea of there being love and wrath, we can swap out the wrath for a little bit more love. Or maybe if there's pieces of God that you can't understand that rationally don't make sense to you, you can take those off like an accessory that you don't want and put a, another accessory on. Or if there's things about God that don't fit your lifestyle, your needs, your desires, you can cast those aside and, and design a God that does. When we treat God like a minifig factory, we create God in our image. We make a God that we want. And so the question we're gonna wrestle with today is that do we worship God as we want him to be? or God as he reveals himself to be. Because when we worship the God we want, instead of the God who is, we trade genuine worship for counterfeit worship. Now a lot of this comes back to our view of God, because your view of God determines your response to God. And so some of us, we have a big view of God. We embrace the God who reveals himself in scripture, we believe that God simply spoke and creation came into existence. And that same God numbers the stars in the sky and he calls you by name. 
He is different than anything we can even comprehend. He is holy and majestic and pure and good. We have a big view of God. And so when you have a big view of God, that necessitates a big response to God. When you believe all of those things to be true, then God is worthy of your whole heart, whole life, worship and devotion. It it flows out of you. I think rationally speaking or on paper, a lot of us would say, yes, I do have that big view of God. But often our lives tell a different story because a small view of God customizes the God who reveals himself in scripture. That means when we look at God, we see someone who's just slightly bigger, slightly better, slightly smarter than we are. And he is safe and tame and easy to understand. He's a God that we've customized to be in our own image, to meet the needs and desires that we have. And so when you look at these ideas, this big view of God and a small view of God, often if you feel friction inside of your spiritual life, it's because you want to have a big response to God. You feel like you should have a big response to God but you have a small view of him. God's really not that relevant or enjoyable, so why would you worship him? So if this morning, if worship felt like a chore, like you just couldn't really get into it, or if reading your Bible and praying and loving and serving God are a struggle, take a look at how you view God. Do you have a big view or a small view? Because a small view of God will always lead to big problems. So today we're continuing our series on the Ten Commandments. We are three weeks in. And the Ten Commandments, they reveal the heart of God. They show us how we can better relate to him and to one another. And inside of that, the deeper understanding we have of the Ten Commandments, the bigger our view of God because we know more of what he is like. And so with that as the backdrop, let's turn to Exodus 20. We're going to read the first and second commandments together today. And God spoke all these words saying, first commandment, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land, or not yet, (laughs) jumping ahead. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commands." And so when we read those two together, it can feel like the second commandment is just a lot more words to say the same thing as the first commandment. But there's actually an important distinction we need to make here because the first commandment, it's about our allegiance. It's what we make supreme, what we put before us. Another way of stating the first commandment is do not worship the wrong God. We talked about that last week. But the way of thinking about the second commandment is that it's about our worship It's saying, do not use any created image to worship God. Another way of stating the second commandment is do not worship the right God in the wrong way. And so we break the second commandment anytime we worship a created image of God. And there's really two ways we can begin to think about this. So the first one is physical images. We're not to make or use physical images as representations of God inside of our worship. Why? Because physical images always conceal more than they reveal. You might have a representation of God that shows that he is loving and meek and mild, but that always comes at the expense of his other attributes, his justice and his power. Inside of that, we begin to want to portray one aspect of God over another. And on top of that, images of God, physical images of God, they make him small. Something we could put in our pocket or see right in front of us. And they trick us into thinking that God's presence is localized into this item. They always diminish who God is. And so we're not to use physical representations of God in our worship. Now we can just take a collective sigh of relief because we're all nailing this one, right? I doubt that any of you were out in your garage this morning carving images of God. And you're probably not in your living room bowing down to a meek and mild, historically inaccurate, blonde hair, blue eyed version of Jesus. It's easy to read the second commandment and be like, we've got this one, we are good. But like all of the 10 commandments, there's always a deeper obedience required of us 
And so we are not to make physical images of God, but we are also not to make mental images of God. What do I mean by that? Images inside of our imagination that imagine God to be anything outside of what he's already revealed in scripture. Because mental images, they do the same thing as physical images. Naturally, our minds are gonna highlight one characteristic of God over another. Or an image that we create, something that we customize is going to conceal more than it reveals and it tricks us into thinking that God is small. That we can think of him and imagine him as we want him to be instead of how he is. When I read the second commandment, as I've studied it this week, the line that keeps jumping out to me is do not make for yourself. In other words, do not imagine, do not customize, do not create. Because as you do that, you are imagining a God that you want to be instead of the God who has revealed himself in scripture. And if you wanna know just what a big temptation this is for us, all we have to do is look at the Israelites. Because just 40 days after God spoke the 10 words, they are already breaking this command. I mean, think how soon that is. 40 days ago was August 29th. Might feel like a distant memory, but not much has happened between those two things. Moses has been up on the mountain with God for 40 days. God is giving him instructions on how to build God's dwelling place, the tabernacle, and the people, the Israelites, are back down on the bottom of the mountain with Moses' brother, Aaron. So with that as the backdrop, let's jump in to Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all of the people took off their rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hands and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. In case you're curious, they're not playing board games. Not good things are happening, but it's so easy to be hard on the Israelites as we read the Old Testament and think, what are they doing? I mean, think about this in context. God just freed them from oppression in 400 years of slavery. They saw him bring supernatural plagues upon their enemies. They watched as he parted the sea so they could walk from slavery into freedom on dry land. And in just the 40 days that they've been in the wilderness, he's been providing for their every need by sending manna, bread from heaven and providing quail. Like really? They don't hear any action for 40 days and they're getting concerned and confused? I mean, come on, Israelites. But an important biblical principle, especially as we read the Old Testament, is that we are the Israelites. We are just as fickle and forgetful as they are and we allow our desires to take over just as they do. So as we think about what happens inside of that story, we can see how we relate to them, that there are temptations that they experience that we too are experiencing. And so let's think about three of them. The first one is when we perceive God's silence as his absence, we are tempted to create a smaller version of God who we can control. The Israelites, they didn't know what happened to Moses and they couldn't see God, but they could see their problems. They could see their enemies. They could see their very real situation. And in that moment, an invisible God who they didn't understand just wasn't gonna cut it. And so what did they do? In what they perceived as God's silence and his absence, they created their own God so they could have someone to lead and to follow a physical representation of the true God. And seasons of silence where we perceive God's absence we're tempted to do the exact same thing because we don't understand what God is doing. It doesn't make sense. It feels like he's just up on a mountain for 40 days and we're not clued into what's going on. And so we wanna form and fashion a golden calf, a God that we can control, a God that rationally makes sense to our mind with formulas. We say things like, you know, if I just try harder, if I could just be a better person, God, then you have to answer my prayer. Or if I don't forgive this person, God, they're gonna feel your wrath and judgment then. If 
I could just have more faith, then surely God will have to bless me. There is no way that God can be both loving and just. And do you see what we do? We take things and we try to control who God is. If you're in a season of silence right now, where it feels like God is absent, or you don't feel him working, resist the temptation to make him small. I know it's hard. I know many of you have been waiting a long time or asking and asking, and it feels like God is not responding, but our God is bigger than we can imagine him to be. Listen to how God speaks of himself. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts, your thoughts. We don't need to control God by our behavior. We don't have to try to manipulate him in a way that we think we can control. No matter what's going on in our seasons of silence, would you rather have a small God you can control or a big God that you can't understand but you know and trust is working on your behalf? Resist the temptation to make God small. The second temptation that we see that we share with the Israelites is that when we are uncomfortable with God, we are tempted to create a smaller, culturally acceptable version of him. So think about the Israelites in their historical context. They have lived for 400 years in a polytheistic culture, a culture with lots of gods. And often in the ancient world, gods were represented by physical images, usually animals. And so there really wasn't a category for an invisible God. It wasn't the cultural norm. And so as the Israelites looked around and they started to see their problems and feel God's absence, they wanted to make a God, a version of God that they felt like aligned with their culture safe, something that was understandable. And it's easy when we come to this story to say, the Israelites, they're breaking the first commandment. And yes, they are. But they are also breaking the second commandment because Israel is using the golden calf as an image to worship Yahweh, the one true God. Listen to what Aaron said. He said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Israel used the golden calf as a way of making God make sense in the age that they live in. Now, I doubt that any of us have a golden cow in our basement. I sure hope you don't. And we probably didn't take all of the gold in our house from our kids and our spouse and create a golden amulet that we could pray to this morning. But just like the Israelites, we are tempted to fashion and craft a God that makes sense inside of our culture. We do this all sorts of ways, but let's think of a couple big ones this morning. We emphasize one aspect of God's character over another. We say that God is good. And you know, he empathizes with us. He knows it's hard for us to follow him. He is loving. And I'm going to focus on that. But when we do that, God is no longer good because we've taken something out of his character. The second one is that if God's word never challenges or offends us, we have made a golden calf. When we prefer a God who only affirms what we affirm and who we think likes what we like and hates what we hate, We've made a custom minifig. We've created God in our image. We have made a golden calf and God is no longer holy. Another thing that we do is when our worship is based on our circumstances, we're crafting something that makes sense inside of our culture. It's us saying that, yes, God, I love you and I praise you when life is good. But when life is not, I'm angry and and you can confuse me and you're not worthy of my worship. God is only good when life is good. Well, that means God changes. That is a false God. And if we turn to God for salvation, but give him no authority in our daily lives, then he has no transforming power. He has no impact. And so God is no longer powerful. It's a golden calf. And what we see from this story of the Israelites is that a culturally acceptable God is always God as we imagine, not as he reveals himself to be. The third temptation that we share with the Israelites is that when we worship a God we create, we are tempted to think golden calves lead to freedom. As the Israelites worshiped this God that they had created, a God as they imagined him to be, for a moment they felt free. They had a big party and not the good kind of party. It's like they could have their cake and eat it too. They could say they believed in God and would follow him, but also live in a way that they wanted to live. We do the exact same thing. 
when we custom fit God to meet the image of him that we want, we're living a distortion because we think that we're free, we can do what we want, but also believe in God, but that ultimately leads to our destruction. We're always gonna be disappointed and continue to be enslaved in the idolatry that we're practicing. Freedom is never found in a distortion of God. It's never found in a God that we create. It's only found in God as he reveals himself in scripture. Jesus talks about this in the gospel of John. He says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and what? The truth will set you free. And so as we think about these temptations, at the end of the day, we have a choice to make. We can choose to worship a God who is big and that we can't understand, that we don't have a category for, or we can worship small gods of our own making that will never satisfy us, that will never lead to freedom and to flourishing. So how do you know if you've made God small? How do you know if you're worshiping a custom-made God in your image instead of the God as he reveals himself in scripture? So for the next few minutes, I just wanna get really practical and think about some signs that will help us consider if we're worshiping God as we want him to be or worshiping God as he creates and reveals himself to be. A big view versus a small view. So here's the first one. It's a wonderless life. When is the last time you marveled at God's goodness or were blown away by his power? When was the last time that you considered that the God who simply spoke creation into existence knows your name? When was the last time that you meditated on God's majesty and his glory and the fact that he is holy and something we can't comprehend? If your faith is stale and boring, then your God is small and safe. Second one, prayer is your last resort, not a first response. So when something is going on with you or someone in your life, where do you turn for wisdom or for comfort? What's like your gut reaction, the very first thing that you do? Is prayer your lifeline? If we believe in a small God, then we pray small prayers. But if we have a big view of God, we come to him confidently and expectantly, knowing that he can help us and wants to hear us. The third one, limited access. Does your relationship with Jesus impact some areas of your life, but not all areas of your life? So maybe you turn to to God for questions of spirituality and morality, but when it comes to things like money and sexuality, those are off limits. That means you've made God small because a big God speaks into every area of our lives. The fourth one, you're super skeptical of the supernatural. And so when you hear someone talk about seeing God move in powerful, supernatural ways, what's your initial response? It's good to have wisdom and to be discerning, but if you don't have a category for a supernatural move of God, then you're worshiping a small God because God, as he reveals himself in scripture, creates and commands angel armies and heals and raises the dead and makes a way for salvation. We have to have a category for the supernatural. Number five, you're content with spiritual snacks. Are you allowing God to reveal himself to you through his word? And if so, how? What's discipling you? What are you following? If your idea of reading scripture is taking a one-liner from Instagram, or reading an inspirational devotional every day, then you're missing out on the bigness of God as he reveals himself in his word. We have to be people of the word if we have a big God. Number six, shame is your shadow. Has shame become such a familiar part of your life that it is always with you, that you can't shake it? It almost feels like another appendage at this point because there's a sin from your past or your present that you feel makes you completely unworthy. Like God could never love you or forgive you. Shame is always a sign of a small view of God because a big view of God is that he's forgiven you and he's already called you worthy and righteous and loved. Number seven, like is greater than love is worship about what you like or who you love. What makes you get into worship? Is it if if you like the song, you like the style of music, 
Maybe it's a church that fits the tradition that you grew up in or you really connect with the pastor. That's not just worship, those are emotional responses because that's what feels good. That's a small view of God. A big view of God is that he is worthy of our whole life worship, no matter where we are or what music is being played or what style a speaker has. That means as true followers of Jesus with a big view of God, we can proclaim the truth of God inside of a Catholic mass. We can do it at a charismatic revival and we can do it at a small country church because we have a big view of God. Number eight, fear factor. Are you afraid if you don't control the situation that it won't work out in your favor? Is your life right now just so weighed down by worry? And you feel like you're shouldering everything for everyone and always trying to manipulate all of the pieces just right so that everything works out. If you feel the weight of worry and control, then you have a small view of God because a big God has said that he will carry that for you, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You don't have to be afraid. Number nine, sign that you have a small God is that you have an attitude of entitlement. When you look at the blessings in your life, you think, yeah, I've earned those. I work really hard. I'm a really good person. Of course God would bless me. If we have an attitude of entitlement, that means we have a big view of ourselves and a small view of God. But to have a big God means that we know that every good and perfect gift inside of our lives is from him. And so gratitude pours out of us because we don't deserve any of it. It's all grace that flows from a big God. And number 10, the gospel is old news, not good news. Are you amazed by God's grace? Or has the good news that Jesus loves you and died for you become old news? Just kind of white noise, something that you don't think about anymore. If we have a small view of God, then we have a small view of the gospel. But if we have a big view of God, we know that we don't deserve any of it. That God's grace and his mercy is so amazing. We never get over the miracle of the fact that we were blind and now we see. So there are 10 signs that maybe we're making God small. And I would bet that most of us could relate to one of them. If you're like me, you can relate to multiple of them. In fact, just this week, I was convicted a few days ago as I was prepping for this sermon because we had an incident with one of our kids that we weren't expecting and we're seeking some wisdom on. And so immediately I texted a few of my close friends to kind of get their thoughts and of course talk to Brad about it and definitely consulted the internet. And God convicted me that I was not his, he was not my first response, or my second, or my third, or my fourth. That I was searching wisdom and guidance from other places, and I felt like he said to me, Amanda, do you have such a small view of me that I'm like that low on your list? That I'm on par with a Google search? Like, don't you know I have all the wisdom and direction and peace that you need right here? We're all tempted to have a small view of God, to custom fit a God, to meet our wants and our desires, but that's not the God who reveals himself to us. And ultimately that's not the God we need. And so now what? Now that maybe the Holy Spirit has convicted us that we do have a small view of God, what do we do? Well, it takes a conscious turning turning from this little custom God that we've created in our own image and turning our eyes to Jesus and knowing him and loving him as he's revealed himself to be. Earlier this week, a friend of mine sent me a quote and it's really helpful here. It's from Patrick, author Patrick Morley. He writes, there is a God we want and there is a God who is. They are not the same God. And the turning point of our lives, you're looking for breakthrough, here it is. The turning point of our lives is when we stop seeking the God we want and start seeking the God who is. Our truest identity, our greatest freedom and flourishing is only found inside of the worship of the one true God because that's what we were created for. But God is so good and so gracious and so patient with us that he knew 
that in the absence of an image of God, we would create our own. And so what did he do? He sent Jesus so we could see him in the flesh and know exactly what God is like. Paul says this so well in Colossians. He says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he, Jesus is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile himself, all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. If we wanna have a big view of God, we have to stop looking at everything else. We have to stop thinking about how God is silent or how our culture views God or this perceived idea of freedom that we could have. And we have to start looking at Jesus because Jesus revealed to us through the scriptures is the fullness of God. Jesus said, to know me is to know my father. And Jesus was present at creation. Everything is created through him. That means he knows everything about you. He knows what's in your mind right now and what you're going to speak before you say it. He knows what's best for you. And Jesus leads and sustains us as his people, the church. Jesus alone is the conquering king who one day will reconcile and restore to himself all things. It's Jesus who is the sacrifice, who frees us from the slavery to sin and gives us peace with God. And Jesus is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. Everything. No matter what you are dealing with today, Jesus is before it and he can hold it together. He's a big God. And as I prayed through this this week, really seeking the Lord on what are you trying to tell us through the second commandment? What are you speaking to Northway in this moment in time right now? God brought me to John chapter four. Jesus had a conversation with a Samaritan woman and he uncovered her sin and her shame and he talked to her about eternal life. But she turned the conversation on its head and started asking some religious questions. And she basically said, who gets it right? The Samaritans who worship over there or the Jews who worship over here? What's true worship look like? And Jesus responded to her, but the hour is coming and is now here where the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, God is invisible. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So what is God speaking to us today? To worship the revealed God of scripture in spirit and in truth. What does that look like? It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you were convicted today that maybe you've made God small, that you've customized him to fit an image that you want him to be, the Holy Spirit will speak truth to you as you read the Bible. The Holy Spirit will equip you to understand and to know who Jesus is, to grow in your relationship with him. You walk in that power. And then in truth, we worship God by knowing how he's revealed in his word. I feel like loud and clear what God is saying is just read the Bible. Know who I am, know who I have revealed myself to be, not who you want me to be or who culture says that I am or this image that you have in your mind. I'm showing you right here. This is your invitation to know me. And it's in the knowing of Jesus himself that everything blows wide open, that we are changed and free and whole. And so today, Jesus is inviting you to know him, to open the pages of scripture, to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart to reveal that truth so you can know Jesus and walk in the freedom and flourishing that he provides. Would you pray with me?
God, you are so good and so patient with us as we, like the Israelites, are fickle and chase our own desires. And even as you brought conviction in these last few moments of places where we've minimized you, where we've cast you aside, where we've put you in a box and made you small, we repent of those things. And God, we ask your Holy Spirit to fill us with a holy imagination that we would see Jesus, who you have revealed to us, who you have spoken through so that we can know him and love him. God, would you give us collectively as a church a hunger for your word and the courage and boldness to stand on your truth, and the deep desire to know you in that way. We thank you for Jesus. We love him so much and it's in his name that we pray, amen.